It was the most powerful political idea in history. A new faith for a skeptical age. It promised a world of harmony and abundance. If only property were shared by all and distributed equally. The idea was called socialism and it spread farther and faster than any religion in history. Then, in almost the blink of an eye, it all collapsed. What happened? In this series, we trace the rise and fall of an idea that changed the world. An idea that promised a heaven right here on Earth. century brought with it a faith in limitless human progress. Old beliefs rooted in religion and superstition were abandoned in favor of new ones supposedly based on science and rational thought. One of these new ideas was called socialism. Hello, I'm Ben Wattenberg. Welcome to Heaven on Earth, a think tank special. In this hour, a British reformer creates a model utopia on the American frontier. Soon, two German philosophers recast the idea as prophecy, arguing that socialism is the world's destiny. And as the 20th century begins, a Russian revolutionary sets out to fulfill the prophecy at any cost, including mass murder while peaceful reformers across Europe and North America respond very differently to socialism's call. And so we begin in America. The United States is not yet 50 years old. Land in the West is plentiful, a magnet to new settlers and to new ideas. Indiana, 1825. A great experiment was unfolding on the banks of the Wabash River. It was called New Harmony, and it would be a community of equality, heralding a new way of life, and eventually a new kind of world. Its founder was a British industrialist named Robert Owen, and his followers would soon coin a name for his vision. Socialism. When Robert Owen arrived in America, he was already famous for his progressive ideas. His cotton mill in New Lanark, Scotland, was the most heralded industrial enterprise of its day. He shortened working hours, restricted child labor, and even provided sick pay. And Owen not only cared about how his 2,000 employees worked, he cared about how they lived. Anyone who would live um, in his properties there at New Lanark had to live by his rules, and they were very specific. Um, how often they had to put out their trash, how often they had to bathe, when people needed to be home at night, the fact that they couldn't be publicly drunk, they had to spend time with their families, those kinds of things. Education was a key part of Owen's reforms. Rather than putting his employees' children to work in the factory, he put them in school. He also created the first preschool in the United Kingdom. It was part of what he called the Institute for the Formation of Character. Owen was developing a theory of human nature that would remain one of the fundamental ideas of socialism. It would resurface again and again. He felt you could actually mold human character. And he in fact said it is of all truths the most important that man's character is 
made for, not by himself. So he's an environmental determinist, and he believes that if you can begin virtually at birth and have this child in a superior environment, then you will, through education and liberation of this person's intellect and spirit, you will actually produce a perfect character. He called this the second coming of the truth. Um, I think he really did believe he was the second messiah, that he had come unlike Jesus, who could only tell the truth in parables. Owen, on the other hand, could actually say the literal truth, because he had the science. People took Owen seriously. When he arrived in America in 1825, a joint session of Congress was convened to hear his ideas. Before an audience that included President James Monroe and President-elect John Quincy Adams, Owen announced he had purchased an entire village in Indiana. There, he would further the work begun at New Lanark. But this time, his community would be one of true equality. Harmony, Indiana was founded a decade earlier as a different kind of commune a religious one. Owen bought it from George Rapp, the charismatic leader of a sect of German Lutherans who were pulling up stakes to follow one of Rapp's visions. They left behind 160 buildings and some 30,000 acres of fertile land. If you think of, of Indiana at that time period, uh, it was the wilderness. And here in the middle of the wilderness, you had this beautiful town of brick and clapboard houses, a magnificent cruciform church in the middle of town in the commons. It was very sophisticated. It was called the Athens of the West at that time. On April 27, 1825, Robert Owen welcomed 800 eager arrivals to the town he had rechristened New Harmony. One group in particular was attracted to New Harmony, intellectuals. The village soon became a center of progressive thought and experiment. You had um, education at all levels, from infant to adult education. You had a newspaper being published. You had natural scientists out exploring the environs of New Harmony and beyond, creating natural science books to show people about the, the wonderful new species they're finding in the Midwest. You had people lecturing about equal rights for women. You had people lecturing about abolition. This was in 1827, 1828. To coincide with the 50th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence in July 1826, Owen issued what he saw as the next step in the liberation of humankind, the Declaration of Mental Independence. From here forward, he proclaimed, man was free from the trinity of evils responsible for all the world's misery and vice. Traditional religion, conventional marriage, and private property. The last of these was key. The quest to do away with private property would animate socialism for the next 150 years. I 